They're going to use this stuff to get greater control of you. See, because it's your fault. Because you're breathing. And you're creating heat. And you eat food. And you do this. And you drive a gas vehicle. Boy, if we get everybody on electric, then everything would be, pro all the problems would be solved, right? <laughs> Think about this for a minute. Stop for a second. One percent, maybe? I don't even think it's over one percent of the vehicles in this nation are electric, right? And you're already hearing people scream about the grid. The grid's overwhelmed. So, I, I mean, it doesn't take maybe one more brain cell than a cow to figure out there's a problem here? Yes. Hello? <laughs> Something's going on. And, and if they get everybody pushed in this direction, they, they want to they huddle us all in like cattle where they can control us, right? Tell you what you can think, what you can wear, where you can eat, what you can eat, where you can go, what you can buy. How about this? The Bible says you're going to be not able to buy anything. Okay? How many of you people know how to grow your own food? Do you know where we're going? I'm telling you, it's going to get pretty crazy. And I think it's happening faster and faster. Mm -hmm. Now, there is ways God's got to slow this thing down, but this thing is moving and it cannot stop. It's not going to stop. By God's grace, it can slow down or it can speed up. But when time runs out, if you haven't learned not to just read your Bible, but to really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're in some trouble as a church, as individuals. I mean, was it Gary that preached here a few weeks back? And he said the spirit of prophecy said that, uh, what was it? One in 20? One in 20. Think about that. One in 20. Look around you. I don't know how many people are here. Maybe 50. So what's that? Two and a half people? Two and a half people. Who is the two and a half people? Hello? Everybody thinks it's you. Right? But think about this. My, my point here today is don't miss out. Paul thought he had it all. Saul thought he had it all figured out. He thought he was the man. He was doing God's work. You think that you think the Pope, when they were, you know, killing people back in the Crusades, that he was doing God's work? Hello. I can't speak for his his thoughts, but you know, there's good people that are messed up, and some of them are us. Hmm? All right. That he, okay, let me just, I'm going to just read it over again. It's half a sentence. Christ, the great teacher, sought to win the minds of men from the contemplation of earthly things that he might teach them of heavenly things. Wow. Had the teachers of his day been willing to be instructed by him, had they united with him in sowing the world with the seeds of the truth, the world would be far different from what it, is, from what it now is. Think about that. Had the scribes and Pharisees joined their forces with the Savior, the knowledge of Christ would have restored the moral image of God in their souls. Do you see that? Do you hear that? Hello? Well, we have the Holy Word. Hello? They had the Holy Word. No. You know, we had this saying when we were kids, whoopee-doo, right? <laughs> but the leaders of Israel turned from the fountain of true knowledge. They studied the scriptures, listen to this, they studied the scriptures only to sustain their traditions 
and to enforce their man-made observances. Okay? Do you hear that? Listen, it doesn't take a highly intelligent man or woman to stand up here and make that Bible say anything you want it to say if you want to take things out of context. If you don't dig in and get here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, you can do that. And think about this. This is our... Our preconceived mo notions, the things that we think we know, cause us to look at the world in a particular way. You know, think about this for a moment. When you learn a new thing, right? Something that you just, something deep that you never knew before, it changes the way you think. It changes the way you think about the Sabbath, the Sabbath truth, right? Now, because you know the Sabbath truth, when you read the Bible, you don't read it like most of the Christian church, right? They completely miss that. It doesn't mean the same thing to them. But you have that truth. And because you have that truth, it causes you, as you read and study your Bible, to see things differently than most people, right? And you, have, you gain an understanding about something, it changes everything. Because you have a brand new view. So everything that you thought you knew in a certain way gets changed. You see more depth. You see more color. Right? And that's a blessing. But we can't stop there and stand on that. But if you stand on that one thing, right? It's like, hey, look at the stars. And you're sitting there stuck on your finger. And you're looking at the finger, but you miss millions of stars. Billions of galaxies. The Bible clearly states that we know nothing as we ought to know it as we ought to know it. So if we come at studying the Bible with this attitude as a little child, as Jesus has said, come to me as a little child, like I, I don't know anything, right? Think about how fast you can grow and how much Jesus can feed you because that's what he wants to do. He wants to feed you all the best stuff. You know, truth, brothers and sisters, it's, it's not always pretty, but it's necessary. It's necessary. I lost my place, so give me a second. But the leaders of Israel turned from the fountain of true knowledge they studied the scriptures only to sustain their traditions and enforce their man-made observances by their interpretation they made them express sediments that God had never given were they doing God's work doesn't sound like it their mystical construction made indistinct that which he had made plain do you see that? Something that's been made plain can be distorted. Distorted. They disputed over technicalities and practically denied the most essential truths. Can you imagine that? How far down can we go? God's word was robbed of its power and evil spirits worked their will. Did you hear that? How far down can you go? Evil spirits worked their will. Who works our will? Who works your will? Jesus said, I always do the will of the Father without fail. The only place that I can find in the Bible that Jesus even said, wait a minute, 
is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's like, I, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. But nevertheless, thy will, not my will. Can you imagine taking this? I can't even deal with my own sin, let alone all your sin. Jesus took every sin, past, present, and future, upon his frame. The same equipment that you and I have. He carried. He hungered. He thirsted. He sweat. He was tired. He was a man and took it all. I don't know what more he could have given than what he gave. Christ's words contain nothing that is non-essential. The Sermon on the Mount is a wonderful production, yet so simple that a child can study it without misunderstanding. Isn't that beautiful? Think about that. The, the great teacher, Jesus, taught in such a way, in such a way that a little child can pick the fruit off the tree and get it. And scholars can be befuddled in the depth. The Sermon on the Mount is a wonderful production, yet so simple that a child can understand without misunderstanding can study it without misunderstanding. The Mount of Beatitudes is a symbol of the spiritual elevation on which Christ ever stood. Every word he uttered came from God. Every word he uttered. Okay. Right there. Every word he uttered came from God. Means what? He said, I am always in the will of God, right? So he gave up his will to obtain God's will for his life. Now, I firmly believe, until somebody can prove me wrong, that we either speak God's words or we speak the devil's words. There is no middle ground. If one of you guys can prove to me different, I'm willing to listen. But that's where I stand. Think about this. Jesus always, not his will, not the devil's will, right? God's will. Constantly. Peter says to him, oh, you're not going to go to the cross. You're not going to the cross. And right after he said, that on this rock, right? I will build my church. Peter says, yeah, you're not going to the cross. Jesus says, what did he say? Hmm. So why did he call Peter Satan? Because Peter was speaking Satan's words. Jesus is not a liar. Hello? Not a liar. If he told one lie, he can't be my savior. Every word he uttered came from God, and he spoke with the authority of heaven. The words that I speak unto you, he said, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. His teaching is full of ennobling, saving truth to which men's highest ambitions and most profound investigations can bear no comparison. No comparison. He was alive to the terrible ruin hanging over the race, and he came to save souls by his own righteousness, bringing to the world definite assurance of hope and complete relief. It is because Christ's words are disregarded, because the word of God is given a second place in education, that the in infinity is riot and iniquity is rife. Things of minor consequences occupy the minds of many of the teachers of today. A mass of tradition contaminating merely a semblance of truth. 
is brought into the courses of study given in the schools of the world. The force of much human teaching is found in assertion, not in truth. The teachers of the present day can use only the ability of previous teachers. Did you hear that? And yet with all the weighty, weighty importance that may be attached to the words of the greatest human authors, there is conscious inability to trace back to the first great principle, the source of unerring wisdom. There is a painful uncertainty, a constant searching, a reaching for assurance that can be found only in God. The trumpet of human greatness may be sounded, but it is with an uncertain sound. It is not reliable, and the salvation of souls cannot be assured by it. There is only one, Jesus, the way and the truth and the life. And you may be in a church that doesn't teach the truth the way it should. But long as you know Jesus and you have his relationship with him, he's going to steer you in the right direction. So even if something is done wrong or said wrong, he's going to lead you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is just a road map. Just a road map. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Our closing song is 311. There you go, buddy. Here you go. Mm-hmm.
notions so that we can be like little children so that we can see things in a brand new way you know that it, it, it's possible for us to have brand new feelings brand new thoughts brand new emotions that we never even knew existed Lord if we could look through your eyes by allowing you to have first place in our lives Show us the way through Jesus, and in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. 